All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Saurav Khandelwal. I'm a software engineer at Databricks, uh, where I've worked on various key areas to scale and manage our Kubernetes platform. Today, I'm going to talk about how we build an automated way to manage the lifecycle of our Kubernetes clusters in a multi-cloud environment. And this was instrumental to uh, meet the growing demand of compute that we have seen at Databricks. For those who are not very familiar with what Databricks does, uh, Databricks aims to simplify data management by providing a comprehensive, collaborative, and scalable platform for data and AI. So as you can see in all these bubbles, we have, we have different solutions that are catered towards different personas who want to leverage data and AI capabilities, uh, be it a data engineer, data scientist, machine learning engineer, Gen AI engineer, or uh, data uh, analysts. Uh, we have one platform where they can come in and uh, get, leverage, get insights from their data. A lot of these products that we, I discussed before uh, are actually powered by our serverless architecture. By serverless, I mean that like, we manage the compute for our customers so, the, so that our customers don't have to worry or like, deal with uh, managing uh, or setting up their accounts themselves, uh, and they can get a very serverless experience. Um, let's like, dive deep into how the serverless architecture looks like. So we have our database customer who wants to leverage some of our products. The request actually comes to our control plane service here. Uh, our control plane service, our, our control plane cluster actually uh, hosts a bunch of Kubernetes services. As you can see, our front end facing service is the web application service. Uh, and then we have a couple of other services like DB SQL for our SQL product, Mosaic, M, Mosaic AI for our AI uh, product. Uh, the request from the control plane service uh, gets routed to our data plane. D data plane is uh, the place where we, uh, we basically schedule all our customer workloads. Uh, who wants to run their data and AI tasks. Um, data plane, uh, think of data plane as like a large fleet of Kubernetes clusters where we host all our customer workloads. So uh, this, all these workloads uh, talk to the customer's account where the customers store their data in either of the three clouds, S3, ADLS, or GCP. And uh, uh, they basically run uh, and like all the tasks, uh, get the data and run the task on top of that, on top of the clusters. All, as you can see that like uh, all our cluster like, our clusters are actually at the core of all database tasks and uh, over the recent past we have seen tremendous growth in our serverless compute um, we manage over thousand Kubernetes clusters today and all the growth uh, we have seen uh, the, all these clusters are created in the last three years only we are present in all three clouds AWS Azure and GCP and we are deployed in more than 60 regions as of today. So in order to scale our serverless compute, we really need to scale our cluster management. So by cluster management, what I mean is uh, these operations. The first is the provisioning and deprovisioning of our Kubernetes clusters. It should uh, be multi-cloud, it should be scalable and reliable. And the second operation that we do very commonly is upgrades where uh, we actually support two kinds of upgrades. Uh, the first is uh, supporting cluster rotations, where we bring in a new cluster altogether with a new configuration, and then we retire the old clusters. This kind of upgrades are necessary when we want to do any major infrastructure changes, like doing updating the network of the clusters or doing any major Kubernetes version upgrades. And the second kind of upgrade is in-place upgrades, uh, where we update the nodes of the clusters, as well as the Kubernetes control plane. There is a similar talk given by my colleague in the next room, uh, who's going to focus more on the in-place upgrades. For my talk, I'm mostly going to focus on how we scaled provisioning and deprovisioning of clusters and the upgrades which require cluster rotations. So let's try to understand what cluster provisioning exactly entails here. Uh, so our goal is to provide a ready-to-use clusters for our customers. By ready-to-use, I mean that like our customers do not have to our customers are nothing but our product teams who wants to like, run, uh, they run different, uh, 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 different kind of tasks on top of, the, uh, on top of the cluster that they are creating. Uh, so by, by ready to use cluster, I mean that they don't uh, need to worry about like, provisioning low level cloud specific details or worry about multi-cloud heterogeneity. We will take care of everything and hide uh, everything from them and create all the resources that are necessary for them to use it. So 
let's try to understand like what are all the resources that we do in cluster provisioning. So we have to create the network where the cluster is going to be created, like the VPC or the VNet and the subnets of the cluster. Then we create the actual base cluster in the cloud. We actually use cloud managed Kubernetes for this. AKS, EKS, and GCP, you are probably all familiar with this. And then we create the node pools on top of the cluster. And then we create a couple of cloud resources, like the IAM roles, who, uh, where, uh, who basically these IAM roles are created to give access to our clusters, whoever wants to give, get access. And then the event hub and Kinesis stream uh, to store the logs and stream the logs. There are a couple of cloud resources that we create, which I have not mentioned here. Um, uh, and then we also do a couple of infra setup, uh, like uh, setting up the monitoring, logging, RBAC, uh, creating Kubernetes secrets uh, that are commonly used by all the workloads that are on top of the cluster, and some of the essential infrastructure services, like uh, one of the commonly used infrastructure services, like the Cert Manager, which basically manages and issues TLS certificates uh, that, that for anyone who wants to create the TLS certificates. And then uh, there is like ingress proxy, which manages the ingress traffic that is coming into the cluster. So yeah, there are a couple of other infrastructure services which I've not men mentioned here. Uh, uh, but yeah, this is like these are all the things that we need to provision uh, to make the cluster ready to use. So we had a framework before, but uh, we ran into a lot of challenges using that framework. What it was was like a single Python script with many many steps into it and they were stitched together as a Spinnaker pipeline. Um, so what the problems we had with this is that it required manual retries if anything goes wrong in any of the steps in the middle. And sometimes those manual retries are very expensive because uh, the steps are not built with idempotency in mind. We also did not have very good monitoring coverage as this was like an offline pipeline running. Uh, we exposed a, low, a lot of low level cloud specific details and uh, the way we did configuration management was not ideal. We basically had one configuration file to read and write input and output, and we merged this configuration file into our code repo. So for any service who wants to discover the clusters, they have to uh, bind it in their service binary and deploy their service to discover any configurations. And we had a problem of leaky abstraction here as well, where our engineers needed to write raw Kubernetes templates or Terraform or CloudFormation templates uh, to create resources or cluster resources. And it was also very hard to tell whether a Terraform template and a CloudFormation template was representing the same resource in two different clouds. So overall, all these problems actually caused uh, our cluster creation and uh, like all the cluster CRUD timeline to take weeks. So we had to come with something better. We actually built a completely new cluster lifecycle framework and we look towards Kubernetes for inspiration. So the high-level idea was to use Kubernetes to manage clusters lifecycle, uh, basically using Kubernetes operator pattern. So in this, what we get is uh, our declarative configuration for Kubernetes clusters by modeling it as a custom resource definition. And then we get continuous reconciliation uh, from the current state to the desired state as uh, the operator pattern provides that. And uh, the biggest advantage here is that like, we, get a, we get to write a single CRD for managing all the configuration of the cluster in all clouds. So let's understand how the exact end-to-end -end workflow looks like here. So we have this top-level Databricks Kubernetes uh, cluster custom resource, where uh, we represent the desired state of the cluster. Here uh, uh, we have the metadata of the cluster, which is just the name of the cluster, and the spec of the cluster, which represents where we want to create the cluster, the cloud, and the region, and some of the cluster configurations, like the node pools that we want to create on top of the cluster, some of the other things which are not represented here are like uh, network, et cetera. And then this CR is actually get applied to our management cluster. So think of our management cluster is another Kubernetes cluster which manages all the other Kubernetes clusters lifecycle. So it basically deploys a couple of Kubernetes operators, which are collectively known as Kubernetes as a service, which interacts with our cloud provider APIs, uh, like AKS, EKS, and GK, to create the clusters created, deleted, and updated. And once that happens, uh, we update uh, the status into the custom resource object, 
So in this case, you can see the status uh, represents of the runtime state of the cluster, like the cube API URL, uh, the cube version that we are using, uh, the VNet, uh, the network that the cluster is using, subnets, the node pool statuses, et cetera. So let's dive deep into and zoom into what the Kubernetes as a service uh, looks like exactly for our end user. So any database engineer who wants to create a Kubernetes cluster, uh, they would come uh, interact with a CI CD job which only exposes only some of the user facing fields like where do they want to create the cluster and what kind of clusters they want. And the CI CD job basically creates uh, the top level uh, database cluster custom resource object which basically have uh, the desired spec like the node pools that we want to create, uh, the network that we want to use for the cluster, et cetera. And this gets applied to our management cluster. As you can see, the management cluster is running a couple of Kubernetes operators or controllers, like I'm going to use this synonymously, but uh, like controllers and operators are meaning the same. So our top level com controller is the CAS controller, which basically uh, orchestrates the lifecycle of the cluster. Uh, it does that by creating custom resources for all the other controllers, which execute different parts of the provisioning. Um, and uh, it, re it basically monitors the status of those uh, custom resources and reads that and updates its own status. So the first one it interacts with on the right is the cluster API controller. So cluster API controller under the hood is adopted from an open source project, uh, cluster API, which is created by the Kubernetes SIG group. And uh, what it provides us is an abstract interface for how to automate managing cluster lifecycle using Kubernetes style patterns and APIs. And it also ensures that like, we get a consistent and repeatable cluster deployments across a wide variety of infrastructure environments. So cluster API controller is essentially doing the orchestration work here. Uh, it requires an infrastructure provider to implement the provisioning of underlying resources. And all the infrastructure providers are the bottom three controllers here, uh, which is the cap Z for uh, the Azure controller, uh, which interacts with Azure Cloud. Uh, CAP-A, which interacts with AWS, and CAP-G, which interacts with GCP. And uh, it, these are the controllers which actually takes care of uh, doing the CRUD of the resources in the cloud. So as you can see that like end-to-end, -end, our customer experience, our database engineer's experience is just that they have to define some of the input fields and everything is taken care of them uh, in a cloud agnostic way. So let's try to evaluate uh, what improvements we have made with this solution. So here, uh, I'm going to represent uh, the old Python script run in, the, in red, and uh, Kubernetes as a service operator in blue. So earlier, we required uh, manual retries. With this, we basically build it with continuous reconciliation towards the desired state as Kubernetes operators provide us. Earlier, we lacked idempotency. Now, we, our operations invoked by the controller is actually idempotent uh, as they are uh, they are basically needed to be idempotent uh, because they need to run continuously. We had incomplete monitoring before, but uh, with this service running as an online service, we were able to enable rich monitoring and uh, logging capabilities. Earlier, we exposed low-level cloud-specific details, but uh, with this, we abstracted out majority of the cloud-specific details by offering a consistent interface across all environments. So, yes, we improved a lot of things, but uh, have we solved all the problems here? Um, let's try to see how our client to end cluster provision pipeline looks like now. So, it still has a couple of steps which are stitched together as Spinnaker pipeline. We did resolve uh, the base Kubernetes cluster provisioning and all the details of that very well. Like the uh, CAS cluster is taking care of that, but there are things which happens before the provisioning and after the provisioning which are running into the same problem, like we need to get the network to create the cluster, and then after the cluster is created, we need to configure the cluster, deploy infra services on top of them, and publish the cluster so that our control plane services can discover the cluster and run customer workloads there. So it has the same problems of uh, uh, not being reliable, which are uh, all the steps which are before and after the cluster provisioning. It had the problem of scalability. It was hard to create multiple clusters across different clouds and regions at one go. What our engineers needed to do was to run multiple runs of this uh, pipeline 
and uh, it used to take uh, a lot of time to do that. And the upgrades, that required cluster rotations, where we bring up a whole set of clusters and retire old clusters. It required us to run uh, multiple runs of the pipeline to create new clusters, and then delete all the clusters. The end-to-end -end latency we did not solve uh, from the first uh, framework. Uh, it was uh, still very high because of the way we managed uh, the configurations of the clusters. The configurations of the clusters were still merged into a code repo, and uh, it was uh, basically anyone who wants to discover the clusters and uh, use those clusters, they had to go with uh, uh, their service deployment to get these con configurations into their service binary to discover that, and sometimes it could take a week, depending upon the frequency on which the service deployments used to happen. So how do you, how do you solve these problems? We basically came up with a, another level of abstraction on top of our CAS abstraction. What we created is like a cluster set lifecycle manager service, which manages our clusters in the unit of cluster set. Here, we basically have all clusters in the set with ha which ha that ha have the same configurations. And uh, what CSLM does, uh, the, this lifecycle manager does, is that like, it basically orchestrates and carries out all the steps that were present in the Spinnaker pipeline in a much more efficient and reliable way. And this is deployed as Kubernetes operator as well. So let's try to see how this interface exactly looks like. So the cluster set, uh, this is basically the representation of the desired spec for the cluster set. Here we basically, in the meta editor, we specify what, where we want to create the clusters in the set. Uh, the location can have the environment, the cloud, and the region where we want to create the cluster. And then we have what kind of cluster we want to create. In this case, we are creating model-serving cluster. Uh, the type of cluster determines what kind of resources and node pools that are going to be provisioned for that cluster. And then uh, we have the spec of the cluster, which basically has the number of, has a count field, which represents how many clusters we want to create in the set, what kind of features should have, should be present for this cluster set. Like one example is uh, private connectivity. So by private connectivity, I mean is that like uh, we want to have the ingress and the egress traffic from the cluster to be completely going through our private network instead of our public network. And this will, in order to enable this feature, it will require provisioning some resource as well. And then now uh, we create the node pools for the cluster. We have all the infra services represented here and the upgrade strategy. So upgrade strategy here, uh, essentially, I'm going to talk more about the upgrade strategy in some later slides. But basically, this determines how to upgrade the clusters. And then um, in the status, uh, once the clusters are clusters in the set are created, uh, the clusters status is captured in the status field, uh, where we have all the clusters in represented by their name. And for each of the cluster, we have the metadata field and the spec field, which essentially uh, copied from the cluster set spec and metadata. And then uh, we have the status field for each of the cluster, which represents what the state, current state of the cluster is. Uh, whether it could, whether it is in creating state, ready state, or it is in deletion state, and the network that is being used by the cluster, what are the infra, infra services status that the cluster is actually uh, deploying? So, let's try to understand how the how it works end to end, uh, how we create and provision all the clusters in the set end to end. So, here, uh, as you can see on the top left. We have our database engineer uh, interacting with the configuration uh, service. So for the database engineer just needs to give some input fields, like where do they want to create clusters, how many clusters do they want to create in the set. Uh, and then we manage a bunch of configurations internally, which is completely controlled by, the, by our compute infra team, uh, like uh, the kind of uh, uh, node pools that you want to create in the cluster, the, ver the Kubernetes version that we want to create, uh, the kind of uh, resources that needs to be created for a particular kind of cluster. So all these configurations are managed internally, and these two configurations are combined through our cluster set config generator logic. And uh, we basically create this top level cluster set specs, which are the desired specs, by each location. Um, 
and then this uh, desired specs are getting applied, gets applied to our cluster set lifecycle manager service, which basically uh, hosts two top level controllers. Uh, the first one is uh, the cluster set controller, which basically manages the lifecycle, uh, which basically uh, manages uh, the top level operations like adding clusters to the set, removing clusters from the set, and upgrading the clusters within the set. And it interacts with uh, the cluster controller, which is the main orchestra where the main orchestration logic lives, which uh, carries out interacting with different systems and life and uh, controllers to carry out the provisioning and deprovisioning of the resources. So as you can see here, it uh, interacts with uh, the cast controller, which we had seen before. Uh, it creates the custom resource for the cast controller, and the cast controller takes care of creating the base Kubernetes cluster in in the different clouds. It, uh, interacts, it also interacts with different cloud provider APIs to create different resources. And uh, it uh, creates other custom resources for other controllers that needs to create different kind of resources, like for example, private connectivity, networks, etc. So once all this provisioning is done, uh, it goes and talks to the release system to get all the important essential infrastructure services to be deployed on top of the cluster. So once, we, once it orchestrates and gets done with everything, it updates the status, and we say that the cluster is ready to use, and anyone who wants to use the cluster can make RPC calls to this lifecycle manager service to get the clusters uh, discovered. So uh, as you can see that, like, if you look at the overall picture here, like for our end user, they just needed to specify only a few input fields, and everything is orchestrated and automated for them. So in this case, uh, let's try to see how the cluster discovery happens. Uh, so for cluster discovery, what we did was uh, that like we basically ran a background job which can publish the cluster status by reading uh, the status from the lifecycle manager service and publishing it as a config map to each of the control plane services who wants to discover those clusters. And we did that uh, by publishing it as a config map. And uh, we were able to actually run this uh, very frequently and uh, it also did not require us to do any service deployments. All the cluster discovery was dynamic in nature here, and we achieved like uh, a discovery within an hour with this method. So now that we understand how the cluster provisioning and cluster discovery works, let's try to deep dive into how uh, we how it helped us to do an automated way of doing upgrades that require cluster rotations. So. For cluster rotation upgrades, we basically have these four major steps. Um, the first is to create a new batch of clusters with new configurations. The second is to drain their workloads from the old clusters to the new clusters. And the third is to delete the old batch of clusters. And then we repeat these steps from one to three to get all the clusters upgraded within the set. So how it works is that uh, for the end Databricks engineer who wants to upgrade a cluster, they just create an updated spec of the cluster set. Here, uh, they are trying to upgrade a Kubernetes version for the clusters. Um, and the upgrade strategy they are using is uh, a cluster rotation with the max surge of three. By max surge, I mean that we will upgrade the clusters with the max batch size of three, uh, and we'll create like three clusters at a time and upgrade them, not more than that. So this updated spec gets applied to the CSLM, uh, the cluster set lifecycle manager service which basically orchestrates all the steps that we had seen before, creates the cluster, creates three new clusters, and once all the clusters are created, it publishes those clusters to our control plane service, uh, which wants to leverage those clusters and discover them to run the, our actual customer's data and AI tasks. So the control plane service has both uh, the knowledge of the old clusters and the new clusters. It drains the workloads from the old clusters to the new clusters, and once all the training has happened, we delete uh, the lifecycle manager service deletes the cluster, deletes the old clusters, and this process repeats until all the upgrades has happened within the cluster. So to deep dive into how exactly the state machine looks like for the upgrades, um, as you can see, like let's try to understand that here. Uh, so the top box is our lifecycle manager service, which carries out the lifecycle management of our clusters. Here we are representing, going to represent 
the uh, new clusters in green and the old clusters in blue. We also call this as our blue green blue green upgrade as well. The bottom panel is the uh, serverless product service, which actually wants to discover uh, the cluster and manage the cluster to run the customer's data and AI workloads. So when the clusters are getting created, uh, it, the, the first state is creating when we start provisioning different resources on the cluster. And when all the resources are provisioned, we say that the cluster is ready. And then we start deleting the old clusters. The first state we say is that schedule, we schedule the cluster for deletion. This is an indication that like the old cluster should start deletion. We publish these clusters as config map to the control plane service who wants to discover these clusters. The control plane service, when they discover this cluster, they activate the new cluster and they start draining the old clusters. And once uh, the drain has completely happened, uh, they retire the old clusters. And uh, after the cluster is retired, the control plane service basically sends a RPC call to uh, confirm that you can like confirm the lifecycle measure that like it's okay to delete the cluster. And uh, on receiving on receiving of this RPC call, uh, the lifecycle measure service changes the lifecycle state of the cluster to deletion confirmed, where it actually starts uh, to tear down the cluster resources. And it can, and once the cluster is completely deleted, we say that the cluster is uh, in a deleted state, and this basically continues for each of the clusters in the set. And this is how we automated uh, the entire end-to-end -end, uh, upgrade process uh, without any human interaction in this place. So let's try to see uh, how this one fares with, uh, uh, with the previous, th previous challenges that we have seen before. Uh, in terms of uh, scalability, uh, it's definitely scalable now because we are able to create multiple clusters across different regions and clouds at one go. And our upgrades are completely automated uh, with our end users just needed to, needing to update uh, and supply the updated spec. In terms of reliability, uh, yeah, we are able to achieve uh, much better reliability as we are able to run this as a Kubernetes-style operator, uh, which gives us idempotency and uh, automatic retries by, uh, from the get-go. And in terms of end-to-end -end latency, uh, we are able to achieve a dynamic discovery of clusters, uh, which allowed us to have uh, the, uh, the discovery of clusters to be within one hour. That's all I have for today. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have uh, anything that is top of your mind. You can ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very interesting because like we just finished deploying something very similar down to the name of the CRDs. Um, I was wondering how you did uh, handle like different workloads talking to each other within the cluster. So when you're tearing down and like moving workloads. You need them to still talk to each other. Did you m merge the meshes in Istio? How, how did you handle that? So you ba basically, are you asking that like how the how the customers' workloads which are running on the cluster, how did they discover that like uh, where to run? Is that what you're asking? Well, uh, do you have communication between services staying within the cluster? We always go through routing externally. That's uh, where like got it. So in this case, uh, I'm specifically talking about uh, the data plane clusters, uh, where we run, uh, yeah, we run a bunch of uh, services, demon side services, plus also a bunch of uh, customer workloads who are running their data and AI tasks. So they they can just so when we uh, when we bring up the new cluster, uh, we basically we uh, we stop scheduling any of the new uh, customer workloads or services on the new cluster, uh, on, on the old clusters, and then we slow, we basically migrate all the workloads from the old cluster to the new cluster. So the services internally did not have to communicate. Uh, they, can, uh, they can just, uh, uh, as the new services are coming in, uh, 
There's like a proxy layer which handles the traffic routing between the old cluster and the new cluster. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is really cool. Also, we've been implementing something like this for the last two or three years and finally got it reliable over the last year and it's really interesting to see how other people arrive at the same solution. Uh, one of the big pain points for us though, and I think our workflow is much different, is um, auto-scaling. And so our old clusters are auto-scaled um, to handle the load that they're currently under and we would run into trouble, you know, shifting, in our case, shifting traffic to a new cluster that was under provision. Um, in your case, are you relying strictly on the draining to get that new cluster scaled up to whatever capacity it needs before you start tearing down the old? Um, like, are you, are you auto, are, do you have auto scaling enabled on the old cluster? Um, and if so, um, are you just relying on the workloads being drained and migrated to the new cluster to scale out the new cluster to the appropriate capacity? So we, we do have auto scaling enabled, but uh, the auto scaling is enabled on the node level, not at the cluster level. Uh, so by by that I mean is that like within the cluster, if we want to scale, if we want to uh, have more customer workloads, we will be able to scale the nodes. But uh, in order, to, so we are currently working on auto scaling feature on at the cluster level as well, where uh, if if we are running out of capacity where uh, like we have exhausted all the nodes onto a particular cluster and we want to bring up new Kubernetes clusters to host new customer workloads, uh, those are actually not auto-scaled. Uh, we creep a warm pool of those clusters uh, without any nodes in them. And then uh, when we want to leverage those clusters, uh, we get those clusters in, uh, uh, we basically schedule work customer workloads on top of those clusters so that we can scale the nodes but the auto scaling is not enabled for, uh, for where we scale up the clusters automatically. We, someone has to, some, some engineer has to manually go and like create new clusters or up, basically do this operation of scaling up the cluster set yes. by creating, by increasing the count of the cluster set and that takes care of creating new clusters. It's something we spend a lot of time on synchronizing scaling specs between clusters before flipping traffic and whatnot. All right, cool, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, I have one question where you are saying that uh, you are creating and managing this cluster using a concept of cluster set. So that cluster set itself is a controller in it which runs on one of the cluster. I think earlier in the one of the first design you mentioned that it's called a management cluster. Right. Right. So my question is that how do you create and manage the management cluster? A. <laughs> yes. Good question. <laughs> where do you run it? B. And uh, what? happens in case the, there are an issue with the management cluster itself, which has a controller running. And how do you detect that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, so the, we create the management, so we don't have the same tooling uh, to create the cl management cluster. Uh, it's basically a chicken and egg problem, right? Like how do you create the management cluster uh, in, an autom in an automated way? So management cluster is not created in an automated way. We, as it does not need to be, does not need to have the same uh, uh, same uh, scaling and uh, automated operations that needed to be done within the management cluster itself. So it is being brought up uh, using uh, a stitched together uh, uh, like Python script like that we had before. Uh, and uh, we basically use homegrown Kubernetes to create this uh, management cluster. Um, and it is uh, run uh, in all three different clouds in different, uh, so currently, our management cluster is uh, is a central cluster which is run as one cluster per cloud. But we are trying to get to a place where like we can run management clusters in all the regions so that we can get more highly available uh, things uh, in place. Uh, and if management cluster goes down, it's not the end of the world uh, because like uh, at the end of the day, what what happens is that like uh, uh, we. Uh, the cluster operations are not that high QPS operations, right? Like uh, we we do do capacity map planning and like create uh, one pool of clusters, and if the management cluster is down for a few hours, uh, we are just not able to create new clusters or delete new clusters. Uh, but uh, like we have enough uh, pool of clusters to be leveraged from. If I can add uh, to that question, so. What kind of technology you are using under the hood? For example, are you using Golang to build this operator or cloud formation versus Terraform in order to manage the cloud resources? Yeah, we use uh, Go-level Kubernetes operators. Thank you. Yeah. Our question, uh, how do you manage system resources, uh, system 
add-ons uh, like core DNS. For example, if you need to change cache settings or like queue proxy configuration, like enable, disable metrics. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so what we do for that is that like, so we also have a couple of other operators running in our management cluster. And uh, those operators are responsible. So they're also managed uh, by submitting custom resources for those services. So if so core DNS and some of the other services, they are deployed as, uh, think of them getting deployed as uh, infrastructure service, uh, which has, uh, which is basically taken care of by our CI CD pipeline. Uh, we have a very robust uh, release pipeline through which we deploy and upgrade uh, services. And uh, under the hood, some of the services are running are run as Kubernetes operators, uh, where we basically create custom resources and uh, we update custom resources to manage those. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Thanks for the talk. Yes. Hey, hi. Uh, can you talk about some of the pre-steps and the post-steps you mentioned about the network provisioning and, and whatnot, and how you were able to tackle that in your new approach? Right. So what specifically do you want to know about the pre-steps and the post-steps exactly? Uh, yeah. Um, like, for example, the provisioning of the network, um, that's a pretty essential step for your building up the new cluster. Are the new clusters are coming up on the same VPC or same network? Right, so uh, yeah, so for a cluster, uh, we for a cluster to run, we basically have to know where it should run, like which particular uh, network uh, VPC or subnet it should use. We we have uh, multiple clusters to be created in the same VPC, but uh, they are not never created in the same subnets, uh, and we have a very complex network architecture uh, use that we use to uh, uh, to create the network. Um, and um, like uh, the network is actually provisioned uh, using another uh, operate another controller service, uh, which takes care of creating the network, creating uh, the uh, like. So some of the network resources are pre-provisioned, but some of them are actually pr provisioned at the time of cluster is getting provisioned. Some some of them are like uh, which requires where well, we can't pre-provision them as as they cost a lot of money for us, like NAT gateways, uh, EIPs, and all those things. Uh, so we create them. Uh, we create them at the time when we are provisioning the cluster from the cluster set lifecycle manager service, by, and they, it interacts with uh, the network controller service to create get those uh, resources created. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I don't know if you can hear me. Here we go. Um, yeah. One more question. So I don't know when you started this, but just given you know the number of vendors are out here, different people who are thinking about this problem, would you do it the same way if you started it today, or have you thought about other technologies that you would potentially make use of? Yes, that's a really good question. Uh, so um, yeah, if uh, there, there are a couple of things uh, we can improve uh, on what uh, we have already built, uh, like for example, the way we spun up the management cluster. Uh, we uh, basically created a central centralized cl cluster for that to man uh, to manage. Uh, it is not very highly available, so if we had to redo again, we will basically create uh, it in a in a more regional way and create a better automation for doing that. Uh, and uh, we also took very incremental step here, like we first took an approach to just automate the lifecycle management of the base Kubernetes clusters that interact with cloud managed Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and then we basically build another layer of abstraction on top of that. If we had to redo again, we'll basically uh, have more cleaner abstraction for doing all the resource provisioning from the get-go using this approach. Are there any other vendors that you would consider? I mean, did you, like, would you think of a cross-plane or a radius or any other in that space? Um, so I would say that, like, uh, Databricks has a very complex architecture. We are deployed in multiple clouds, multiple regions. We have very complex networking. Um, and uh, we explored a few vendors, but uh, it would not meet all the demands. And uh, we want to move fast as well. So we want to have things in our own control. Uh, uh, 
so yeah that is like one of the primary reason we have we we basically take automation very seriously and uh, we do try to automate a bunch of things uh, and uh, we invest a lot into this uh, however we basically use a lot of open source uh, stuff uh, and we leverage a lot of them uh, to to build uh, to basically incorporate in our uh, in our development uh, but uh, are you, do you uh, have any specific uh, thing that you have in mind uh, no, it's just something that's right now in the back of my head um, that we're thinking through. The ones that I mentioned are some of those that seem like they're in the same space, but I'm wondering if you know of any others. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about, like, if you have any more ideas about this. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I think we are over time. I'm happy to answer any questions offline as well. I'll be outside. Um, I'm going to leave uh, my LinkedIn uh, link as well as uh, we are hiring actively at Databricks. So if you have, uh, if you are looking for jobs, uh, I linked my open, uh, like our open positions here. Thank you, everyone.